Well, we're going to jump into the sermon here and uh, uh, start off with just a couple of things of information related to it. There was a a fairly recent Gallup poll that reported that 77% of those people who were who were interviewed and surveyed uh, felt that 77% of these people felt that religion in America is losing its influence. And then if you've not read, George Barn is kind of a church expert and he writes about the church and uh, he puts it very bluntly in his book, The Second Coming of the Church. He says, let's cut to the chase. He says, after two decades of studying the churches in America, I'm convinced that the typical church as we know it today is, has a rapidly expiring shelf life. Now that's not Barna saying the church is ending or anything like that, but as we know it, the church is changing at the very least. And back in 1998, Barna predicted that within a few years, uh, America would either experience one of two things, either a massive spiritual revival or total moral anarchy. And now 20-ish years following that prediction of his, uh, we really don't see the massive spiritual revival, and we're beginning to see more and more of moral anarchy and chaos. And so uh, I think he may be somewhat right. And put simply... Uh, The church in America has, it seems at least to me, lost a portion of its influence. And there's many reasons why this is so, but there's one reason that seems to stand out above all of the rest. And it's that the church has lost its influence because Christians have neglected the responsibility to be light into the world. And as we have neglected to be what God has called us to be, the world has then chosen to begin to ignore us. Now the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, he knew that that they were an island of light in a city that was filled with darkness. And, And how could a tiny little band of believers in this city make a difference in this giant cosmopolitan metropolis? Uh, This place that was home to the world-famous Temple of Artemis. And if you don't know what that is, uh, just a crazy place of debauchery and very perverse worship. And in Ephesians 5, 8 through 14, which is going to be our key verses today, so if you don't have a Bible, feel free to grab one or iPhone or iPad or whatever you've got. But Ephesians 5, 8 through 14 is where we're going to be. And, and there in Ephesians 5, 8 through 14, Paul kind of gives us his answer about what we are and what we are to do. And he basically tells us that we are no longer free agents, that we are the light of God. And then we're supposed to live like it. We're supposed to let our light shine. And as we let our light shine, it will begin to dispel the darkness. And Paul tells us that as we do that, some people won't like it. And that we should shine our light anyhow. And as we shine our light, others will begin to shine alongside of us. And as we study the Bible, we can learn and we can see that what worked in the first century can still work today. In our passage, there are three different remarkable results of when the light shines and how God enters into the dark world because of it. If you're following along, look at verse 8. It says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. And here we have a a beautiful picture of conversion. Coming to Christ is like walking into a a, a blazing bright bright room out of complete darkness. And if you've ever experienced that, um, maybe you've been outside in the dark and you walk in and your your pupils can't quite adjust fast enough, but, but when you come in from that darkness... You begin to see things that you couldn't see before. When you had lived in darkness, you did whatever it was that you wanted to do. But now that you've come into the light, we're told we are to put off the deeds of darkness and put on a lifestyle fitting the children of light. And then in verse 9, it spells this out for us. It says, For the fruit of the light is found in all goodness, righteousness, and in truth. And goodness, it touches on how we deal with other people. Righteousness involves a a new commitment on us to to obey God's commands. And then the truth demands a, a deepening commitment to live in love and integrity. And then Paul kind of 
continues on in verse 10, and he gives us this new goal, and he says, find out what is pleasing to the Lord. And, and no longer can we say that if it feels good, just do it. No longer can we say, just because everybody else is doing it, now we can do it. No longer are we able to say, I don't care any longer what other people think. If we want to truly please the Lord, Paul says, that we will seek out what pleases Him. We have to find it and chase after it and work towards it and march towards it and be intentional about it. And in that and because of that, we're no longer free agents, so to speak, spiritually. Uh, people who could just make up our moral choices as we go along. As Christians, we believe something uh, stupendous in the world doesn't have to confuse us because God can work in it and through it. We believe in amazing things that there's a God in heaven who has spoken and that His Word is authoritative and that He's absolutely right to determine our moral choices. Now as we study that and as we study the Bible, that puts us at odds at times with the way that the world works. See, the world wants to inform us that we can live however we want to live and do whatever we want and not worry about the consequences, but the Bible tells us otherwise, and as people of Christ, we're called to live otherwise. And that includes in things that we say and, and how we behave and, and, and who we have sex with and how we conduct our business affairs and how we spend our money and, and the things that we do and the places that we go and the things that we watch and the things that we say and all of that and so much more fit under that umbrella. The choices in life that we make as Christians, are guided by biblical principles. And at times, and many times, they will put us at odds with the world. And let's be frank about it. When the world looks at us as Christians, because we follow this as our guidebook when we study the Word of God and we get into the Bible, when the world looks at us because of that, we look a little weird to them, right? We look a little strange. Maybe a little mysterious. Maybe a little antisocial. Depending on the context, as we're studying and learning about the persecuted church, maybe a little dangerous. When it comes to these things, these choices that we have to make in life, our, our moral choices, we believe that God has spoken to us clearly about the rights and the wrongs of life. And in short, we believe something that the world rejects, that there is a God in heaven who has spoken and whose words about all these things need to be considered and then obeyed. And that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg of, of how we are different than the world. And Paul's focus goes into every area of our life. If you're familiar and you've read through the New Testament and Paul's writings, he talks about all kinds of different ways and places that we are to be transformed and we are to be changed as the people of God. Things like to be a child of light, that, that we are people of prayer and we pray every day. And one of those prayers should be, Lord, show me, show me how I might please you on this day. How many times do we pray that? I bet not too often. We don't, we don't begin to consider in our prayer life too often, Lord, show me how I might please you on this day. We pray for all kinds of things, but that's not one that seems to come naturally to many of us. Certainly not one that comes naturally to me. But it's one that I think is incredibly important. If you haven't filtered that into your prayer life, I would encourage you to do that. As you're praying, maybe in the morning, or praying over your lunch hour, or praying through a situation, just pray, God, show me how I might be pleasing to you in this situation, in this context, in this place, in this time. And as I've been a, a Christian now for about 25 years, I've come to the conclusion that I don't think there's anything else that matters as much as this. If we truly want to please God, really, truly, honestly, if we want to please God, we will find a way to do it. But we have to be in communication with Him about what it is that pleases Him. 
Now, however imperfect our lives are, however we might make mistakes and wherever we might fail and however times we might fall short, despite that, if we are seeking God and trying to please Him, God will honor that and will work with us in that. He will see that we are trying, even though we fail, and the blessing is upon us as we do that. That doesn't necessarily mean monetary blessing or anything else like that, but knowing and working in and through the will of God will put you in a place of blessing. You will know that God is using you and working with you and through you, changing the world, changing people, changing lives, because you have sought Him out, intentionally tried to connect with Him, and said, God, show me what pleases you. Let me be about that. Look at verses 11 and 12. Ephesians 5, 11 through 12, Paul writes, Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Paul is saying to this church at Ephesus that some of the things that are going on in your town shouldn't probably be discussed in public. And no doubt Paul has in mind these various rituals that were going on that were associated with the Temple of Artemis. If you don't know what the Temple of Artemis was, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was this magnificent, amazing, also uh, sometimes called the Temple of Diana, if you've heard it called that. But it's this amazing, enormous temple uh, in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the most influential and powerful cities in all the lands in those days. And uh, this, this temple was, was a place of overt idolatry. Um, with every sort of imaginable sexual excess would take place there as a form of worship. Incredibly, incredibly perverse. And all sorts of evil, sinful acts and deeds were done there. Things that went far beyond just ordinary acts of rebellion. I'm not going to dig into it because it's a mess. If you're interested in studying it, go ahead, but I don't recommend it. Just trust me, this was a bad, bad place where bad things were happening. And so Paul describes indirectly this evil that's going on there. And he's saying, some of these things we shouldn't eat, they're so bad, frankly. Some of these things that are going on in the world are so gross. Some of these things are so ungodly and, and just vile and evil. Paul says, don't even discuss them. That's how disgusting these things are. And within that, though, he then goes on to point out that need for us to be light, to shine light into darkness. And he's talking about how the, the light of the gospel exposes evil for what it really is. That this little body of believers in this gigantic influential city of Ephesus can be a light, even into that incredibly dark place, this dark temple, this dark place of worship. Paul says, that they can even, in spite of what's going on over there at this other temple, can still be a light into it. Because the light of the gospel exposes evil for what it really is. Let me illustrate that for you. If you were planning to buy a diamond, I, I, when I was dating my wife, I was in seminary, and uh, in Roseville, near where I used to work, there's this off the main roads, back in the middle of kind of nowhere industrial area. It kind of looks like a strip mall, but it's not really a mall because these are like, I don't even know, just like investments and, you know, like uh, insurance agents and, and things that aren't normally in a strip mall, but they still have to have kind of an office kind of building. And, and in the middle of that, there's this door in the middle of this, you know, big kind of strip mallish looking building. There's just this door, and it's like a fortress of a door. It doesn't look like any of the other doors, because like, like, like the State Farm agent, right, they got a glass door, it says State Farm on it, and over here there's some, some guy with some wealth management, and he's got his phone number and all this information on it. But in the middle was, was this door. And, and I had I'd sought this place out, so, so I knew I was supposed to go to this door, but it wasn't until you got right up to the door that you, you could see uh, what this place was. 
And this place was the place that provides most of the diamonds for the rest of the jewelers in the Twin Cities. So behind this door, and in fact behind this door, and then about four others that are inside, this place was like Fort Knox, um, behind these doors you can get into a place where, where there are literally people in there sorting and going through and grading and, and looking at diamonds. Now as I knew I was going to propose to my wife, and I was like, well, I want to go look at the diamond, right? And I want to investigate, I want to see it. And, and when you're going to invest that sort of money, you, you, want to, you want to be able to see what it is that you're looking at, right? And, and one of the things they have there are these, these special, very bright lights that allow you, if you take those, I mean, hard to imagine how much something this small could cost, right? But uh, you take this little, little rock that somebody had to dig out of the ground, somebody's cut and polished, and then you get this bright shining light, and you can get it down in there. And, and I went through dozens of diamonds, and you turn them, and you look at them, and you look at the cut, and you look at the clarity, and if you turn them just right sometimes, oh, I can see there's an imperfection in that one, right? The light begins to expose things as you look at it, right? I looked for hours and hours and hours before I finally found the right diamond that eventually became my wife's wedding ring. And this light, the light that they have reveals what's going on inside of those rocks. And similarly, when the light of God shines down into us, when the light of God shines down into our community, when the light of God shines down into our life, into our family, it begins to reveal things that we couldn't see before. Hidden secrets that maybe we wish we could have kept hidden. But things that need to be brought to the light. When God's light shines into a community, it brings things like corruption to the light. And here's what I know. I know this from personal experience. The world doesn't want that light, but it desperately needs it anyhow. We must take Paul's warning seriously. We can't trifle with evil. We can't just make jokes about the evil of the world and laugh it off. Warren Wiersbe, who's a great, great pastor, if you've not read his stuff, he's written more books than I could even read in a lifetime, probably. He's very prolific. And uh, he makes a really good point in one of his commentaries. And he says, be careful how you deal with the unfruitful works of darkness. He says, the motto today seems to be, tell it like it is. And yet, that can be a dangerous policy when it comes to exposing the filthy things of darkness, lest we unconsciously advertise and promote that sin. And Paul, in the same way, is, is warning in a different way in Galatians 6.1. He says, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. While this sounds a little bit backwards at times to us as Christians, in our zeal to, to help hurting people, sometimes we ignore this phrase. Satan is tricky, right? And he knows that if he can trap one person in sin, sometimes he can suck some of the rest of us in with it. And then get another, and then get another, and then get another. This is why why doctors in the hospitals are, are continually washing their hands so often. Not only to avoid giving germs from patient to patient, but it's also to protect them themselves from getting whatever is going on around them, right? So in our attempts to help others, we have to learn to be careful, lest we too get drawn into the ways of the world. Then we begin to offer rationalizations. We begin to avoid confrontations. We, we begin to allow things to replace the truth. And so Paul is cautioning the people in Ephesus. He's saying, you lived in a place right now that's pretty messed up, pretty jacked up, pretty bad. There's some horrible, evil, terrible things that are going on. And you need to shine as light into that darkness. But be careful as you do that so you don't get sucked into this mess. Shine brightly, but don't allow that to corrupt you. Don't let that darkness seep in. 
Then in verse 13, he describes the result of this ministry as we shine as light working against that darkness. Paul writes, But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. In God's words translation, it puts it this way, very simply, and it's very beautiful. It says, Light exposes the character of everything. It's not hard for us to understand this principle. A a wise counselor once uh, or frequently tells his clients, you're only as sick as your secrets. You can't get better until you begin to tell the truth to yourself. As long as we live, so to speak, a double life, with one foot in light or one foot in dark, it leaves us in a place of forever being torn, of being double-minded and, and unhealthy because our hearts are divided. Many times we say, yes, I want to be a passionate Christ follower. But yes, but. Yes, but I want to hold on to this little thing over here. I want to stay angry at this person over here. I don't want to forgive here. Or I want to control my money here. Or, or I want to be in charge over here. But yes, I want to follow you, Jesus. But. Yes, but doesn't work with God. He wants all of us. Not part of us. Not some of us most of the time. All of us all of the time. Yet we're a sinful people. So we remain in this place of conflict. Being torn, being broken, being not perfect. That is why we have to continually be praying to God, show me what pleases you and let me pursue after that. And as we work on that, we will begin to shine our light. And as we begin to shine our light, we shouldn't be surprised that some people are going to be unhappy about the way that we choose to live and about the things that we choose to do and the truths that we begin to share. There's people who begin to resent us because of that. People who say things like, well, who are you to judge me, right? Well, I'm not the one to judge you. We should always be clear about that. A lot of people feel judged by Christians, right? We're not in a place to judge. We are all sinners in need of saviors. But we are going to live differently, and sometimes as we live differently, that lifestyle is going to make people feel like they're being judged. Because God calls us to shine the light of truth. But then God is the judge in that. It's important for us to keep that in mind as Christians and to try to keep that in balance. The world doesn't like it when we live differently. Now as we do this, with sharing truth and love as the Bible speaks of elsewhere. Truth and love can be painful. And truth and love can hurt. Kind of like the Word of God is a double-edged sword. It can cut kind of in multiple ways in different places. And it can cause pain. But as living out as a Christian and as the Word of God begins to cut, it starts with us. Okay? Whenever, whenever we're dealing with sin of the world, we have to first start with our sin. We can't go to the world and say, you're broken, you need to fix that, while we're over here with our own mess, right? That doesn't work. That's hypocrisy. Now, we're always going to be hypocrites in some level, but we have to start with us first. And as we do that, it's a little uncomfortable, a little painful as we deal with our own problems and messes and sins. But as we do that, as we begin to expose our own mess, as we begin the light to shine into us and then radiate out from us, the world begins to see that change and that transformation. And that change and that transformation is attractive as we kind of get back on the right paths of life. That light exposes all sorts of things, but it's good for us. Because the thing is, the truth hurts before it will heal you. The truth hurts like when somebody comes to you and you've done something wrong, and they confront you about it. That truth hurts first. But if they're right and we're humble, then it can become 
a healing thing. But it always hurts first. It's kind of like the doctor who's got to work on cancer, right? In order to get the cancer out of us, they have to make some cuts. That's going to hurt. But in order for us to get to the place where the healing can take place, those cuts got to happen. If you're following along in this passage in, in verse 13, it actually suggests that, that light has transforming power. When the, when the light comes in, it, it begins to penetrate and scatter all of the darkness. It, it, it illuminates the hidden evil. Remember back to the diamond metaphor. It shows those imperfections that are hiding within. Darkness can only produce more darkness. But light can turn darkness into light. And when God turns on the light, when God shines his light brightly into someone's life, when that darkness is now gone, amazing things happen. God's glory is radiated. And people around it notice and see that change. I mentioned this song a couple of weeks ago. I actually sang a little segment of it. If you were here for this inspiration, right? You guys remember that? It's Hank Williams' song, I Saw the Light. You want me to sing it? <laughs> the words of it, though, are so right. He says, I wandered so aimlessly, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light, right? I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy. No sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. You got to hear Hank's old like, Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I don't have that voice. But he wrote that song many, many years ago. And it has so much truth in it, right? Praise the Lord, I saw the light. When that light shines in, when that light shines bright, it exposes. And in that, we can praise the Lord. And look at verse 14. This is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. And Paul writes, Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. How can a, a dead man rise from the dead, right? Can you imagine somebody going into Sorensen Root Funeral Home, right? Walking through there going, Hey! Wake up! You guys have been dead long enough. Get up! Come on! Pretty sure the staff would come out and call for a padded ambulance for you. Because the power to come back to life is not within them. They're dead. D-E-A-D. -E dead, right? And only one man can raise people from the grave. Only one man can make the blind see. Only one man was the light to the world. Only Jesus has that life-giving power that we all need to move from the darkness into the light. And when the light of the gospel comes in, it begins to wake up the spiritually dead and draws them to Jesus. And this passage shows us what happens when the light of God begins to shine into this world. First, that, that, that light shines on us and it transforms us from darkness into light. And in that very same process, the light purifies us from the inside out so that we can seek what is pleasing to God, where I started to begin with. And the second thing that the light does is as it shines through us, it begins to chase away the darkness. It begins to expose evil that is done under the cover of night. John 3.19 says that, that men love darkness rather than light. That our natural inclination is to seek that darkness, not to seek that light on our own. So often, the world, without Jesus, chases after darkness. It seeks more of it. They fight against the light of God. But when that light comes in, 
when that light does its work, it begins to heal. Because the light comes from God. And because of that, it can take darkness and turn it into light. And we know that's true because that's what happens to each and every one of us as we begin to follow Jesus. The third thing that happens is that the light awakens those who are asleep and raises them from the dead. This is exactly why Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. This is why Paul boldly preached the very words of God, the very words of Jesus throughout an ancient world that was very far from God. As Paul went around on his tours throughout the Mediterranean, he went from city to city, from place to place. And yes, this this temple I spoke about in, in Ephesus was one of the worst places, but there were many dark places throughout the world, many bad places Paul was going to, many places that did not have the light of the world. Places like Corinth, Ephesus, Athens, Rome. And Paul knew what would happen if that light would begin to shine in those societies. That light would begin to expose people and make them angry. Paul knew as he shared that light, he was putting his own life on the line, but he was okay with that. Because he also knew that the very same light that would make a lot of the people angry that very same light would awaken others to their need for Christ. Many of you know who Robert Louis Stevenson was. When he was a young child, he was a very sick child much of his life, and as a younger child particularly. And as a result of that, he wasn't allowed to go out and play. They didn't understand medicine like we know, so he couldn't go out and play with the other kids. So the result of it was he often spent much of his day sitting inside, looking out window, seeing other children able to play. And one evening, he sat there looking out this window, and it was getting dark, and he had a a full-time nurse that helped take care of him as a child, and he was sitting there staring out this window, which was a little peculiar since it was getting dark. And so his nurse says to him, he says, Robert, what are you doing? And he sat there for a moment, And he said, I'm watching that man knock holes in the darkness. See, this man was walking down the street. This was the time when they used to have those gas street lights. And it took somebody to come by to light them. And what a beautiful picture. We are called to knock holes in the darkness in Jesus' name. We were made for times like this. So often I hear people complain about the world, right? Complain about what a mess the world is. Complain about the sin of the world. Complain about the problems of the world. Did you see this, Pastor? Did you hear about this, Pastor? Do you know what's going on over here, Pastor? Most of the time, yes, I know. Some of the times, no, I don't know. But the bigger point is, it doesn't matter. I know that the world is dark. And that we were made to be light. And we were made for times like this. I don't care how dark it gets. I don't care how bad the world decays morally. I mean, I care. But I don't care in the sense that that's going to stop me from being a light. We are called to be a people who knock holes into the darkness in Jesus' name. When the world is at its very worst, the people of God need to be at their very best. We were made for times like these. When we look around our town even, when we look through our community, when we look through the county of Aiken, we see brokenness. My wife and I talk frequently about this. She's a a school teacher. We talk about how brokenness impacts the ability for her to teach. The things that happen outside the school walls have a dramatic effect on what goes on inside the school walls because these children come in broken from broken relationships, from families of addiction, sometimes addicted themselves with all kinds of problems, all kinds of hurts, all kinds of hang-ups, and they come in and then she's supposed to be able to teach while they're broken. 
We see this in our youth groups and our kids' ministries. We see this as adults come in and, and meet with me. We see this at all levels. And I think that God has placed you and God has placed me right now in this place and this time here in Aiken County or wherever it is we live. God has brought us here to be a light into the darkness. Now let's not make any false assumptions. This isn't easy work. Being a light into darkness is not always easy. Because the world doesn't want the light. But it desperately needs it. The good news is that we are not called to save the world, right? Only God can save the world. We cannot save the world. But we are called to make a difference. To be a light shining brightly wherever God put us. We can't do everything. But each and every one of us can do something. It's like that old story. You've probably heard it used in a hundred sermons before. But a man was walking down the beach. And there was a whole bunch of stranded starfish, right? He picked that one up and threw that starfish back in the ocean. Other guy sees him doing this and says, look at all these starfish. You can't make a difference. Picked up another one, threw it on the water, said, I made a difference to that one. We can't fix the world. But we can make a difference. We can resolve ourselves to seek out what is pleasing to God and live in that way each and every day. Fighting against the darkness, shining our light brightly so that others might see. We can do that, each and every one of us. And I think that's why God has called us here today to be light in the darkness, you and me. So this week, let's go knock some holes in the darkness. Let's bring some light into the world, wherever you might go of whatever you might do. Are you with me on that? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray in this moment that we even wouldn't be surprised or even disappointed by the conditions of the world around us, God. The world is going to live as the world does. But we, as the people of God, are called to live differently. And God, you have made us for times like this. And so, God, I just pray that you would give us a new vision of the difference we can make into this world. Lord, show us how and where to be light. God, sometimes, oftentimes, it would be easier just to be a good Christian and, and to sit at home and to read our Bibles by ourselves and not have to interact with the world. But, Lord, the world needs to see our light. And so, Lord, as we, we go forth this week, it is my prayer that you would send us into places, Lord, that we need to be where our influence, because of our faith, can make a difference to your glory and your fame. God, let us be a people who punch holes into the darkness. And God, then as our light shines, may it shine brightly, and may it bring you all glory, honor, and praise. God, let us make a difference today and every day to your glory and fame. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us to the light. Lord, may we seek every day what is pleasing to you. And may that power us to share your love wherever we go. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.